Lord, this church is yours. It's all yours. Every good thing here is your work among us. And we assemble now before you, before your word, to hear from you. Would you please speak to us? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So thankful today to be here with you. So thankful uh, for the people that God has brought to us. Uh, And I hope you understand that when uh, that group of people stood up before you today and we prayed for them, that we're not just celebrating that more people come and sit on the the pews or the the chairs on Sundays. Um, We're celebrating that people want to walk with Christ, with us. And that's what joins us together, is our mutual love and commitment to Christ. And that's why we're together today, is because we have uh, decided to follow Jesus together. And when we see new people come into this, this group, it's, it's not just that we're happy to have people, but it's that these are gifts God is pouring out on the church, because people come gifted by the Spirit, and they will then be used among us by the Spirit, and we will grow as others are used among us. And they'll grow as, as we are used with them. So thank God for, for these people that we are uh, already loving and learning to love more. Today we're talking about anger and uh, good news. Since, since most people don't have any struggle with this, we don't have to spend a long time on it. So we'll just, uh, we'll just move quickly through this. No, seriously, there's a reason why this is the first moral teaching that you encounter in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus understood that this was foundational to life. And that's what we're doing as we study the Scriptures together, and specifically as we study Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount right now. We're learning how to live. Do you want to learn how to live? I don't mean just learn how to get through life. Do you want to learn how to flourish in life? then you get to learn from Jesus. He's the one who understands that better than anyone else. And he knows that if you cut right here, if you, if you make an incision right here, you can operate on the whole person. You get to this root of anger, and so much of human life then starts to go better, starts to become a life that can be lived in a flourishing way. But the, the sad thing is that in our culture, anger is not only accepted, it is celebrated. And in our movies, you see angry people who are the heroes. On our our, uh, news channels, if you're watching much cable news, you'll see that anger is prolific on our televisions. And if you're learning how to live from people like that, you're never going to figure out what Jesus said to do. You're never going to know what he thought about life, or or at least you're not going to understand how that can be real. You're not going to see it modeled, and you're not going to think that's for you. You're going to be spiritually formed in a different way. That's why we are tuning our hearts in keeping with Jesus so we can hear and understand the things that he he has to say to us. This is super important, and I want you to know, and hopefully this will become clear through this sermon and on into the future, this is good. We are not here to talk about how can we lay some more burdens on people. We're here to talk about how people can live. And life is meant to be different. Yes, life is meant to be better when we live with Jesus. He is our teacher. And if you've never accepted him in your life like that, today's the day. Today's the day to accept Jesus Christ as your teacher. And, and, and what's happened, unfortunately, in the history of the church, a lot of times we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, which we should have done. That's very, very important. But we've not accepted him as our teacher. For some reason, historically, that, that nerve was cut. The line that ran between Jesus being Savior and Lord and him being the teacher of the church, we, we cut that cord and, and, and we haven't thought much about Jesus actually teaching us how to live. And that's why our lives are a mess, frankly. And we want to, at this church, at least do our part to restore Jesus to his place as our rabbi, as the teacher of the people. Before we get into what Jesus says about anger, though, I need to just briefly cover uh, how he sets up the sermon, the foundation of this sermon in in, uh, Matthew 5. 
I don't have this part on the PowerPoint for you, so uh, if you have your Bibles, follow along. Maybe you can look on with someone next to you. This is uh, in verse 13. Now, if you were paying close attention last week when Josh spoke, I know most of you weren't, but uh, um, if, if you were, you might have noticed that uh, in verse 11 of the Beatitudes, I thought Josh did a great job with, with this sermon, actually. And, and uh, it, he's talking about these things uh, throughout, uh, throughout the Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who, blessed are those who mourn, etc. Then he comes to verse 11, and there's a shift in the, the pronoun. And, and he says, blessed are you. And he starts talking directly to the people around him. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Well, that links now to verse 13. And Jesus is still talking to these people who, in verse 12, he said, uh, your reward is great in heaven because uh, when you are persecuted, that's the same thing that happened to the prophets who were before you. And now he says to these people, saying, say, speaking to you directly, and we want to see ourselves now as the people surrounding Jesus on the Mount of Olives, and here's what he says to us. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, uh, there's a lot of background for salt and its uses in the past. Steve can tell you more about this than I can. I've heard him talk about it before. Uh, but we don't have time to get into all of those right now anyway. And, and I just want to make the, the positive point that whatever he's saying, he's talking about it, a, an impact. Salt made an impact. Whether you're talking about flavoring food or preserving things or somehow being good for agriculture, salt made a positive impact on its environment. Jesus looks at these people. Remember how Josh talked last week about the poor people, the outsiders, the marginalized, the people who weren't considered to have it all together, the people that weren't really supposed to be the blessed ones. Jesus looks at them and says, you're the blessed ones. Then he goes on further and says, you are the salt of the earth. You're the ones put here to preserve, to flavor, to make the world go okay. That's you. You, next verse, are the light of the world. Can you imagine these people gathered around Jesus who have been hungry, who have been poor, who have, who have thought that they weren't good enough because they weren't like the Pharisees and the, the scribes or whoever it was, and they're gathered around Jesus, and he looks at them and says, you're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You don't have to be a preacher you don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have been raised right. You don't have to have always had it all together. Jesus comes in and intentionally goes to these people and says, you're the ones that God wants to light up the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Here we want to uh, get the idea, it's not just me as an individual, it's me as community. It's us as community. So you have to have, you know, it's always a, a cyclical thing here, you have to have individuals in order to have community. Right? But, but Jesus thinks of us as, as being together too. We are a city. Here at Irving Church, we are a city. And, and then join with the church throughout this city and nation and world. We're the light. And then you go into your workplace and you take your little piece of that light and you brighten that place. You light it up. That's who you are. Jesus was the light of the world, but, but he comes to us and says, you're the light of the world. Because he overflows into us. People don't take a light, people don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but you put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. What would be the point of lighting a lamp if you're just going to put it under a basket? And yet, here we are. God has lit us up. He doesn't want us to be hidden. We are the mission to the world. We are God's mission to the world. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The church is to be a community of people who are flooded with good works. Where a, a, a blazing fire of love and kindness, active love and kindness, are showing the world what life can be like. Let them see your good works. We get uncomfortable with good works sometimes in Protestant Christianity because we've heard that that's works righteousness. And if you try to do good works, then people will say, oh man, you're trying to earn your salvation. There's nothing about earning salvation in this. This is just about being who Jesus wants us to be. Lighting up the world. Okay, quickly moving through the, the next paragraph and then we'll get into anger. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, this is important for our understanding of the Christian faith. People may have been accusing Jesus, accusing his disciples of setting aside the law because they didn't say all the things that they normally heard. They were thinking things differently, were expressing things differently. And, and what Jesus wants people to know is, hey, I'm standing in continuity with what's come before. I didn't come to abolish what's come before. I've come to fulfill it. The question is, how is he going to fulfill it? And we're going to get into that in just a minute. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is going to show us, how Jesus is wanting to fulfill the law. But he's not kicking it aside that dirty, nasty old law. It came from God. And the early Christians understood this. The old law is God's gift. And Jesus comes and says, yes, but we need to go deeper with it. We need to understand its intent so that we can fulfill it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the, others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And here we want to say that what we're talking about with the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus shows us how to fulfill the law, we're talking about doing things. We're talking about being active. And we're talking about teaching the things of God and expecting that we can live into these things. This is so important to understand because a lot of the history of the Sermon on the Mount and its interpretation is people trying to get around having to do it. Martin Luther said it's a council of despair meant to drive us to the foot of the cross. In other words, you're not meant to do it. You're just meant to say, oh, thank you, Jesus, you saved me. And then you just kind of kick the whole thing aside and dismiss it. And you don't learn how to live. And Jesus is no longer our teacher. These things are meant for us to do. And those who are great in the kingdom of heaven are going to learn to do these things. And, and, and as a church, we're going to teach these things. Not in any way to earn our salvation. Not in any way to say, oh, we have to be perfect or God doesn't accept us. That's ridiculous. There's nothing in the Old Testament or the New Testament that indicates that. But the gift of God to us is to learn from Jesus how to live, to, to do and to teach these things. Now here's the real shocker in verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that, to us, that sounds like, of course those jerks <laughs> don't want to be like the scribes and Pharisees. Whoever want to be like the scribes and Pharisees? But that's not the way they would have thought of this, right? They would, have, they would have said, what? You mean the people who have devoted their lives to studying and teaching the Bible? You mean the people who are, are helping everybody else to understand what they're supposed to do and they're encouraging us all to keep all these commands? You mean we have to surpass them? How in the world do we surpass them? And that's where we have to understand a little bit about Jesus' holy, holiness program. And I'm going to probably say more about these kind of things next week. I'm going to give myself permission not to say everything that needs to be said this week. Um, and uh, we, can, we can plan to dig a little bit deeper if we need to next week. But the basic idea we want to understand about Jesus' holiness program and how it contrasts with what the Pharisees and scribes were teaching is that Jesus had a program of heart renewal. Inward transformation 
that led to external transformation, not an either or, not a kind of romantic idea of just how I feel inside my heart. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an inward renewal of life where our heart gets in tune with God's heart. Now, the Pharisees had a purity program that they were offering that it didn't mean that they didn't care anything about obeying God. Sometimes we were a little too hard on the Pharisees. They did care about obeying God, but they had gotten confused about how to pursue obedience to God, and they were emphasizing external purity standards, saying if, if we can get all the people to keep Levitical priesthood purity laws, then maybe there'll be a renewal of the kingdom. And so everybody needs to wash their hands like this. Everybody needs to prepare their food like this, et cetera, et cetera. And Jesus comes along and says, no, we're going to see more about this, uh, more of this as we go through Matthew. That's not the center of things. What you need is your heart to be renewed so that your heart becomes like God's heart. Then you enter into the joy of obedience, the life that the kingdom offers. You're not then tiptoeing up to the sideline of what we've heard is wrong to do and say, okay, I'm not going to do it. This is the line here. I can't commit adultery. How close? You see what I'm saying? This is the way you live. Because God gave me the rule, and I'm a, I'm gonna stay away from that. But what if I get my heart in tune with God's heart? I'm no longer walking up here like this, saying I'm gonna keep the rule. But I'm walking in the freedom to go even a totally different direction from adultery, because I've learned what God cares about. We're gonna see what He cares about in regards to anger here. So let, let me just make one more. Uh, clarifying point we're not talking about perfection here i've already said this but i just want to say it again if you think when we come to talking about about anger that we're talking about perfection first of all it's not a sin to feel anger so i wouldn't even say you're imperfect in fact it's human to feel anger it it lets us know that something's off it's like physical pain anger is function from god i think is to let us know oh something's wrong so just to feel it at least in a in a momentary sense there's nothing wrong with that But even then, you're not going to be perfect with this, especially not right off the bat. And I can say I'm not perfect with it after years of working on it. So um, uh, give yourself some some grace. And uh, the the, the thing I'm concerned about is that if we hear these kind of things in the wrong context and, and then come up with a new law about anger, what we're going to actually end up doing is stuffing anger, and then it will come out in all kinds of different ways, like passive aggression, subtle jokes. Or we're going to end up denying that it's there when it really is there. And we're going to want to act like, oh, I'm not angry. I never get angry. And uh, we, that kind of pretense is never helpful to growth and holiness. So, so let's, don't, let's don't have those kind of expectations. Let's expect that God will work with us as we, as we seek to do what Jesus said to do. And that we will see progress. We'll see substantial progress. But let's don't start pretending with each other because we've read this rule. So, oh, can't be angry. I'm not angry. Are you angry? You're angry, aren't you? Got (laughs) you. No, that's not what we want to do. Look, we're going to struggle with some of these things. Some people struggle with with one thing more than another. Uh, Some people have a major struggle with anger. Some people's personality is more inclined that way. Be who you are, but take Jesus seriously and start growing, okay? And, and, And be able to be open with it. Understand that what we're after is pure hearts. Hearts that are lining up with God's heart. Do you know that sometimes when we talk about having pure hearts... We tend to use that. I'm not sure it's a very biblical usage. Uh, When people say, well, he has a good heart, usually what they're saying is, uh, in contrast to his actions or her actions, they have a good heart. You don't usually hear that, not too often, when you're talking about somebody who's actually doing good things. (laughs) It's usually somebody who's done bad things. Well, they really have a good heart. Well, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, for Jesus' understanding, you get the heart right and your actions follow. And we normally, we're very hesitant to say someone has a bad heart. When we say that, we know we're saying something that goes really deep with the person. Now, I I would say, I don't say this lightly about about many people, but I would say that Wayne Bowen has a bad heart. Um, He he is the only only person, Wayne Wayne and Lorinda are with us today, so I'm I'm, I'm teasing Wayne. Wayne literally has a bad physical heart. But um, um, we're glad, we're glad they're able to be back with us. Uh, but no, we don't usually say people have bad hearts, right? Um, because we don't want to uh, impugn people's motives and, and, and actually say they're bad to the core. What we're talking about is what's in the core of us. Who are we really deep down? 
I grew up watching the Incredible Hulk TV show. He's still my favorite Avenger. Uh, but I watched it back in the, the 80s when, when you had the Lou Ferrigno guy, and he would, you know, he would transform. He would, his eyes would turn green, and he would burst out of his clothes. Still, to me, one of the most incredible things about that Incredible Hulk is that no matter how many times, and he was the most unlucky guy in the world, uh, uh, all the things that would happen to him when he would turn into the Hulk. Uh, but no matter how many times he turned into the Hulk um, he, and, and burst out of all his clothes, he never burst out of his pants. And uh, I think that was truly incredible. I don't know how, they were, how Bruce Banner was working that out, but uh, that, that was incredible. Uh, but you know, uh, the Hulk really was uh, a good metaphor for uh, what we deal with with anger because he walked around all the time, Bruce Banner did, knowing that he had this beast inside him and trying to keep it caged. And he was trying all the time to avoid the things that would make him angry enough. You know, he had that famous line, uh, Mr. So-and-so, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And, and so he walked around all the time trying not to be angry, but he was looking for a cure. That's what he was doing. He was trying to find a cure so that he wasn't this beast really on the inside. It just needed a trigger to come out. And I want to say to you today that in Christ, what we're doing, is we're not just walking around trying to avoid uh, the, the triggers, but we're looking for a cure, something that goes down to the inside so that that Hulk is not always there waiting to explode out of us. We need the cure, and Jesus has it. So look at Matthew 5, verse 21. Here we go. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Now my guess is most of you in this room right now have not been struggling with murder. Now it, it, I say it hesitantly because I know there could be people here who've, who've had that struggle. But, but most of you probably are not struggling with murder right now. And if you are, are keeping the, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, and you've got a rule about murder, you're likely to say, look at me. I'm not murdering anybody. Can you believe all those people who have committed murder? I am so glad to be holy where I don't do that. But you see, Jesus will not leave you alone in your self-righteousness where you have decided that you won't kill anybody. See, that, that's a sideline. And many people walk right up to it and say, well, I wouldn't do that. And then act like they're really holy. But look what Jesus says. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So, so there, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Jesus says, no, whoever's angry will be liable to judgment. And then two other uh, illustrations of this. Some people see a progression here where it's getting increasingly intense. Either way, uh, you get the point. Whoever insults his brother, and actually the, the translation you may have seen before, if you say to your brother, Raka, and uh, people have said that that sounds like the, the uh, I don't know, the, the guttural noise you make when, when you're gathering up spit to spit on someone. Raka. So if you insult your brother, you're looking down on your brother, you'll be liable to the Sanhedrin council. You'll be taken before people for counsel. Illustrations here, you know, not, not uh, actually literally true, but this is what Jesus is saying uh, is the essence of what's going on. And whoever says, you fool, a great insult will be liable to the Gehenna of fire. Now let me say to you, and be very clear here, again, we've got to understand Jesus is not trying to give us a list of rules. There's not a list of words to avoid where then you can say that you're really holy. You know, when I was a kid, I actually, I, I uh, had a pretty strong temper. I was kind of known for that as a kid. And I used to play video games with my brothers, and I got so mad at my brothers. And here, when I got really angry with them, I said to them, I literally said this, you blankety blank. I bleeped myself. I censored myself. I, I, I would not say the words, but I wanted to cuss them, and I made that completely clear, but I knew I don't cuss. 
said, I'm a Christian. You blankety blank. You think God was up there? Have you considered my servant Luke? He won't say those words. <laughs> no, you see, I wasn't, I wasn't getting to the heart of the problem. Probably it would have been better for me to say some cuss words and know I needed to repent than to shield myself by knowing the list of words I could avoid. So Jesus is not just saying, don't say fool and don't say raka. You need to think about the words that you use or the words you see people use frequently on your TVs. Those idiots. And I'm not going to say the, the worst words that we hear. But you know what they are, and you know if you've been using them. And let me say to you that God cares about our words. He cares about our attitudes, and he cares about our words. And how we speak is a huge part of our life with God. Just read your scriptures and you'll see that. And one of the first steps we make in, in pursuing holiness with Christ is learning how to talk to people and about people. And you don't have to insult people. Behind their backs or to their face, you don't have to do that. Especially, Jesus is emphasizing what we say to people's faces here. He says, if you say to your brother, if you insult your brother, if you call your brother a fool, we tear people down with our words. And don't you know, many of you sitting here know this from what you have experienced. How you have struggled deeply because of the way people talk to you as a child and as an adult as a spouse, you know that people have totally disregarded or maybe not even known what Jesus has said about how we use our words. Many times people have gone to church and they've gone home and they have belittled one another and they've done it as a lifestyle. And many, many people have grown up into adulthood, from, whether it's children who have faced that or, or, or spouses. Uh, and, and as we've gone on through the years, we're still recovering from those kind of things, aren't we? Sometimes we, we, the relationship, it feels like it can't even heal with people because those things have gone so deeply inside. And what I want to say to you is that in Christ, there's a different way to speak And if in your home or in your workplace or other settings, you have become accustomed to living a life of belittling others with your words, you can stop that. And God cares that you do. God's concern. When you talk about judgment, that means it's a pretty big deal. And God's concern is not just to judge the people who murder people. He's not just upset about that. He's upset with the people who are walking up to that line of murder whose hearts are not in line with his heart. And there's a different way to live in Christ. Let's look at verses 23 and 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, here's another shocking teaching, okay? Because you did not interrupt the ritual act back then. Unless perhaps the ritual had gone wrong and you had another ritual consideration to bring into play and say, well, you got to fix this. You didn't just interrupt a sacred ritual, a temple offering. Jesus says, if you're bringing your gift to the altar, you've got your ox there that you have prepared and this is the, the really good firstborn that you're bringing to sacrifice. And, but you remember that there's a problem with your brother or sister? Stop the offering. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. Be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. 
This is reorienting people's thinking. Throughout history, there's been such a temptation to elevate ritual behavior in, in religion above moral behavior. And in a way, I think that's because ritual behavior is a lot easier to keep. At least until your heart gets on the right page. And if you're angry at someone, that can be hard to deal with. But it's not hard to say, well, I brought my sacrifice. I did it at the right time. I did it in the right way. Every single time. And so you focus on the ritual. I came to church. Yep, I was there. I did it right. Other people don't do it right, but I did. And there are people who wouldn't miss church if a hurricane was blowing through town. But they'll come to church and sit there totally irreconciled from the brothers and sisters. People in the same room that they won't speak to. And Jesus is saying to that kind of thing, you've got it all mixed up. Get up. Again, this is not a law, it's an illustration. He's not saying literally you have to do this, but, but, but the, the illustration is, is getting people's attention. Get up. Forget about staying for communion. Go over there and talk to the person that you have wounded and make that right. See, God cares about relationships. That's the thing about anger. God's primary concern is not for me sitting in my house and being able to say, I didn't get angry. Two or three weeks ago, Olivia and the girls went out of town, and I took it as a time of solitude. I was in my house almost constantly for a week. You know, I scored really highly on the patience test that week. I could present myself in all good conscience before God. I wasn't around anybody. <laughs> but see, that, that's not God's concern, that I figure out a way not to feel angry. God's concern is that I learn to live with love in the relationships that are surrounding me. That's what God cares about. That's why this matters. And if you're just coming to church and saying you're coming to church and you haven't started really caring about people, then God is not pleased with your worship. So much of our anger is driven by unloving context. And may I say to you that if you're trying harder not to be angry, then you're trying to love people you've gotten out of balance. And you're likely going to fail in both regards. It's a, it's a Buddhist ethic that says be detached from people and enter into nirvana and this, this soul state of calmness. That's not the Christian ethic. We live in relationships. And sometimes those relationships are messy and hard, but we work things out in love and we feel things. But we don't stop loving when we feel things. We work through things with people. And see, as love increasingly takes over our homes and our churches, as it increasingly permeates the atmosphere, anger becomes less of a problem. Not zero. There will still be things that irritate us and frustrate us, but it becomes less of a problem. But when we try to cage anger in a context of a self-driven, self-guided lifestyle, mainly to meet my needs, it's always going to keep popping back up. It's virtually impossible to do that. It's when I start loving people that anger starts to dissipate. When I wake up in the morning before Olivia's awake and I say, I'm going to go out there and, and because I love her, I want her to wake up with some things taken care of. So I'm going to take care of that puppy. <laughs> and I'm going to take care of the girls. And she still doesn't appreciate it like, like I think she should. But you see, what I'm trying to do is say, say I'm going to set love 
as an atmosphere in our home where she wakes up and, and she feels more loved. But of course, you know, Olivia loves me better than I do her. I'm just, I'm really joking about that. I told that whole thing so I could tell that joke, honestly. Uh, but uh, um, in, in all seriousness, love becomes an atmosphere in our home. And, 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 it, and I mean, our collectively in your home, where, where we're thinking about each other, and we're caring for each other, and anger just becomes lessened in that kind of context. Do you see the difference here? The difference in just trying not to get angry with people while we think about ourselves all the time? It's a totally different world. The basic problem, I think, is not that we can't control our anger. The basic problem is that we haven't learned to really love people and value people like Jesus did. And that's the learning we're in for. That's actually what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Now, I'm, I'm over time. I've got to... I've got to wrap this up. If you look at the last part of this, the text, you'll see that Jesus says it's even possible to deal with anger if you're going to court. Somebody's taking you to, or you're taking somebody to a, to a trial. Usually anger is really high level at that point. Jesus says, no, you can actually deal with that and, and uh, try to make friends with people in those kind of contexts. What he's doing is saying you don't have to be dominated by anger. Life can be one where we seek and pursue reconciliation and find that it's really happening among us. Do you believe that? Do you believe Jesus? This can happen for us. Our lives can be lives that aren't dominated and controlled by anger. Here's what I want to do to close with. Um, would you guys please just, Drew, would you give us 60, 90 seconds before y'all come up. And uh, would you sit quietly and ask the Lord if there's someone that you need to seek reconciliation with? And uh, these things, it doesn't just happen automatically. We have to be intentional about these kind of things. We have to make time for it. And would you just ask the Lord if there's a, a person or persons in your life where, where you need to prioritize, where you need to leave your gift at the altar, so to speak, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go be reconciled. I'm going to go act in love. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about them as God thinks about them. Will you do that now? Just take this time to pray, and then we'll, we'll have the praise team come up. Thank you.